testing, 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 testing. I think the sound is probably awesome. Good morning, everybody. Ruth Watson, if you don't type in perfect, I will freak out. I'm waiting with three exclamation points. All right, let's get jamming. Um, last night, yesterday, actually, uh, if you notice here, uh, why does it say published 5.5? Five, five? Oh, I know why, because I'm on a different page. Duh. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so this is our advanced decline. What did we do with the markets? Um, you know, actually, we still have an uptrend. I want to pay attention to the weeklies. And I'm not sure that the wall of worry, we've got two, two ways to look at this market right now. A, number one, the headlines over the weekend was the Dow made a new close. Well, who, you know, I don't know if they're really focusing in on the Russell making a new yearly close. So they, you know, maybe put a positive spin on it. But um, one of the things that I have to point out is even though we made lower price in the Russell, we didn't break down and make a new AD line, and there was no volume behind it. So it tells me that as we get into, like, as you can see here, there's a small seasonal spike that we see that can come on May 23rd, none of the seasonal, not many, let me reiterate, not many of the seasonals that I see are adhering perfectly right to the day. Some are, some haven't. And telecoms has already gotten a boost, as you can see in just a moment. Um, so with that said, what's going to happen with the market? I think that we still have a shot. If this thing breaks out to the upside, it's going to catch everyone short bought. Last week was pretty scary. Uh, the market had a lot of volatility. And uh, I think that most people are still in the camp that they think that the market's going down because selling may go away. And for me, I think the key is that we said for the marketplace, we need to close above that 1882 handle, and yet we've never quite done it. So we still have to look for a daily close over that level. And if we can get a new high close over that 82 uh price action and if we get a pop on the uh, in the as you can see the on balance volume even on a daily basis is above its moving average um, you know what what could we see to the upside how how surprised would everyone be if we went you know another two percent move at this point which would put us to 1912 uh, and if we looked at maybe and I can't grab it I'm trying 1920 level is just over two percent so uh, for the year-to-date gain, that would freak a lot of people out. And so what does that leave us for the NASDAQ? What's the problem with the NASDAQ? And many times I've pointed out the problem with the NASDAQ is simply, number one, biotechnology. And we take a look at what's in the NASDAQ over and over and over. And I think when I look at this NASDAQ 100, I go, why do I even look at this as a technology um, index? It's it's really not. It's a, it's a misnomer. I mean, uh, to be truthful, if you go right down here and you look at a, a casino, whole food markets, I mean, what's a grocery store and a casino have to do in a technology sector? But yet there it is. So tractor supply company, the furthest tractor supply company has got to be the furthest thing. I mean, literally, it's opposite ends of the spectrum of a technology name. I don't know if anyone's visited a tractor supply uh, store, but it's pretty much synonymous with uh, down home on the country. My dad lives in uh, Normandy, Tennessee. And uh, he's into the um, tennis. His wife's uh, uh, Robbie. Uh, you know they train and breed. Uh, they had a grand national champion of the uh, Tennessee walking horses. And so when we go to visit Dad at, at his place in Normandy, Tennessee, uh, to be truthful, there's two really big stores in that area: Walmart and Tractor Supply Company. Those are the fun stores to visit. Um, any event. So when we take a look at the the overall uh, weight of this market. It's going to come from some of these biotechnology names. And uh, I have actually uh, looked at a few of the biotech, and I think we see a potential for, since that sector, we warned everybody and everyone in this room, everybody knows, we warned about the biotech back in March weakening. Now I'm saying it could possibly uh, help support the market. So we've got to watch for some of the biotechnology names. In any event, um, I just wanted to say that the AD lines on a weekly basis, except for the Russell, and the Russell I've just explained, as bad as everything looks, we're at pivot support. It can't break, and uh, this is a quarterly pivot, by the way. 
and with the uh, the lack of the volume and with the lack of the advanced decline leaning on this market, um, I suggest that we're you know due for a little dead cat bounce. The NASDAQ 100 needs to get a break above the a closing price I think will trigger, and, and I've been saying this for I don't know how long, two weeks, a week and a half, at least two weeks. Um, we need to get a break above the April 10th high, both in the Qs and the NASDAQ 100. And if we can get a break above that level, I'm adding on to my July options. I'm taking some heat on them, and I know uh, last week we said with the low close doji, I want to get short, we'll do a little SDS, and if the market pops back up, I'll get the hell out. So I took a little nick there, and I'm still looking for uh, a price advance, which I think would be a major surprise still to the upside. Um, you know, sometimes the markets just, what they do is they bore us to death. They, uh, they tend to do what we want, but not within the time frame we think it's going to happen. I don't know how many people have had that opinion about a market, and you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait, and when you least expect it, it moves. So you're right, but the market bored you out of the, the position. And that's what the market's job is, to scare you or bore you out of your trade. With the July options, I think we were going with the seasonal aspect of the market. There's a lot of time, and just in case it took a little bit longer, I wanted to have that extra 30 days of, of, of time value on the option. And So anyway, I, I'm not abandoning this uh, theory or trade, and I'm looking at this advanced decline. And if, if you note here on a daily chart basis on the NASDAQ, if we were just trading volume and advanced decline, forget price. So if you are trading this and you're closer to the yearly highs, in fact, if you look back here since March, and if I draw a little longer term since the high in March was established, we are not very far off from this very same high peak in price back in March 4th which is 3715. We're at 3569. That's a whale of a difference in price. So let me demonstrate one more time. When when the last time we had an advanced decline reading here, we were up there in price. So right now we're starting to see the advanced decline level reading almost at the same level that the old price was. And we take a look at the volume action at that very same point in time. We're almost at the same level reading. So if we were actually trading both the volume as in, if this blue line was price, and or if we were trading this purple line as price, how many people think this looks bearish? I mean, it doesn't really look ultimately that bearish. All it's going to take is one really big up day and you're going to see this daily moving average pop. The, uh, you're going to see already the advanced decline pop. And um, then I would suggest that anyone that was bearish on, on this index is going to quickly change their minds. If, if we do see a pop and we get back just to that level from Friday's close to that level right there, uh, try to be as exact and precise as possible, it's not a 3% move that I'm predicting. It's a 4.65% move. So therefore, the, um, the whole concept of, of the longer term or going into July concept of the NASDAQ is still alive and well, and I just wanted to bring that to your attention. All right, so let's get to our, our daily sheets and uh, go to uh, our multiple time. And yesterday when I did this, in fact, I loaded this yesterday morning. As you can see, or yesterday afternoon, I did this at 2.26 in the afternoon. So the sheets that we have to work with, we can just immediately look at gold. This is um, the first I thought, watch for an initial rally to fail. Watch for an initial rally to fail near 12.96 to 12.99 level. Well, when we take a look at gold, uh, we're going to cross this on, cross this right off our sheets because this morning, as we go and take a look at gold real quick, we did have an initial, just like it says, watch for an initial rally to fail. 
the, the rally came up between that 1296.99 and it only failed for one, two, three, four, five, six hours or six time periods, an hour and a half. There's an hour and 45 minutes, there's two hours. And then all of a sudden at 8.30 this morning, pop goes the weasel and the market just broke straight back up. So the initial rally that I was looking for, if this market was truly going to be bearish, it should have, it should have held right at the midpoint of this breakdown candle should have held at the moving averages. So when we walk in today, if the market rallied, it should have generated some type of a sell signal. It didn't do it. Now we go back to the drawing board for tomorrow and see how this market uh, actually trades for the rest of the day. In the meantime, we also want to uh, still stay focused um, at this 1280. It's just amazing that the market has traded and it's traded and it's traded and it just won't. Because so it's either going to do one of two things. This is a seasonally weak period of time. Last week's uh, market price decline, trend is still strong, it came on weaker volume. So we made a new volume low last week, but not on price. So I'm not, I'm not so adamant about looking to take any type of long positions unless both price changes with accompanying volume and we get into the seasonally strong period of time, which the clock is ticking down because it's in as many of you know, July, late July, early August for uh, gold prices to start their seasonal price increase. So I, I wanted to go over gold. Uh, it's got um, obviously a, a very long term type of trend that will not go up. It won't go down. It's still in a range. But I thought that for today, if we did pop up into that resistance level based on last week's volume analysis, that we would get a sell off. Maybe it's going to come, but it's not at where we think. It even came well beyond what the person's pivot said, and we don't have a uh, sell signal. And as you can see, we just crossed the threshold at 1301.8, which will generate, or 7, here it is, a daily buy signal. So we're back to the drawing board. Leave gold alone for today, unless we get a close under 1280. So that's an old message. We haven't changed it. In addition, um, DES, we still have two-sided range until we close above that 1282.5 or below 1256. Uh, the British pound, I was looking to sell near 169.04. Uh, the British pound, 169.04, and here we are. We have this little low-close doji. The market almost got up there. We got missed it by like five ticks. We're trading at 87. So um, here's another way of playing this. If the market, you get this little... Um, downdraft and it goes back up near resistance. I want everyone to watch for today's daily opening range over the next couple days. We don't have to look for a break below this low. If this market went down, reversed back up, watch for breakdown through today's opening range. It's all the way down there at 48. So if you cross underneath the opening range up in right in there, then I would look for continuation lower. This little short term uptrend here, that trend line, if you note that if you we really got this down into a like microscopic uh, uh, point, it will also intersect, it would break down below if we get below the daily opening range or the overnight opening range is what I consider important because that's where the market opened. It all gapped a little higher. If we get down there, then I'm suggesting watch out for short-term trades to the downside. So set stops or to, to enter in a trigger to the downside or at least a trade alert. Unfortunately, it'll probably come because it is the pound in the overnight action probably in the next uh, couple days. So pay attention to that. All right, so then we, we jump right in from top to bottom. We take a look um, at our sheets. We talked about the pound. Coffee, sell near 2 bucks, 0.65. Here's the next... Uh, uh, area. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen, but you guys that you know may be interested in a coffee trade. It's a very high risk uh, mover. It's three hundred and seventy-five dollars per penny move. It's a wild one, but you know what? Make a market. If the if we do see in this very strong seasonally weak period of time, we get tendencies to see one little rally, and then after this in coffee, as you can see, on or about five sixteen, um, and that's in you know the next couple days. Market peaks, goes down, comes up, and then bang. It, so if we get any shot of a, a market that's you know, in a topping pattern, 
And when you're in a topping pattern, you know, it's what happens is people think the low's in, they get short, and then it pops back up. I don't want you to do that. I think you just got to wait and, and look for market moves. Just as a, you know, in, in, in last week's action, if you pop all the way back up to this level, you know, you're going to be selling a $6,000 move. You're going to be selling at the area where there was selling, right? And so if the market, looking at this daily chart, I mean, that was a, a whale of a move in just two days. So like I say, it, it's a big boy trade, and there is some inherent risks with that. Uh, because your stop is pretty wide, and, and and I've tried to get you know whether you get it or not, we'll watch it. But it's um you know it's just a trade from a seasonal perspective. And if we take a look at what I'm looking at, if coffee and is it capable of getting back up there? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've got it nailed down to like a, a two and a half, uh, less than just under two and a half points. So you know it's close to eight hundred dollars. I recognize that. The fact is, it is coffee, and it's worth looking at. So then we talked about gold, and we talked about bonds. Bonds have a doji from three days ago, and today we may close under a, and make a low close doji and get a daily trigger to the short side. One of the ways to look at this is we'll be looking at the knob spread. But if we do get a, a, a reversal in the bonds, I think anyone that was looking for stocks to go down that bought bonds for flight to quality, flight to safety, may just have a a um a short term um surprise to the downside i would say that we could easily get a move back to the bonds even if we only get back into this area 134 26 that's from friday's close about a basis point or a full point move 32 30 seconds okay um and we take a look at our daily sheets here um, I've got Cisco to discuss, XLY is still in the diamond pattern, RCI to discuss, Intel to discuss, and I've got this stock here called INAP. And maybe for the room it might be something that's pretty interesting, so let's get busy. So first off, hopefully everyone was able to get their sheets and upload them. Let's take Cisco from top to bottom. Cisco, uh, the volume action actually was not that bad. We did generate a daily buy signal the other day. I think a move, and especially if you can see these swing highs, it gets up there and it pulls back. So on a daily close, over 22 ways to play this for um, Intel. If this market is going to rip to the upside, technically this is what we've kind of achieved. We've broken out of a little downtrend. We've got a, a, a buy signal. It's making higher lows in the beginning stages. It came close to its monthly pivot. So I think Intel has at least a little, you know, a shot. And it's not the greatest trade in the world, but we could see a move this week up to about 23 and a half. And by uh, the end of the month, perhaps Intel, for whatever reason, could see a pop up to uh, the 24, uh, 36 level. Two ways to play it. Aggressive traders look to be a buyer near um, the moving average to the prior, which Friday's low, the ninth. If you look at that, it's 22.90 up to uh, 23, somewhere in that zone. I want to. I wouldn't want to risk this trade. Not underneath this big hammer low. I think that's where the market came down and stopped everybody out, hit some stops, triggered to the upside. I wouldn't want to see the market get back underneath this low right here. That to me is the real low. So from a risk reward uh, perspective, if you think about it, you're risking approximately under 2%. And uh, what would you want to expect to make on that trade? At the first objective, you would say 2.5%. And on a second objective, if it does get up there, uh, we would want to look at, uh, if it does get up here, about a 5.73% objective. So Cisco, it's pretty optionable. It looks pretty reasonable on not just the daily charts, but also note that the weekly volume did start to pop its head back. It tested and checked that weekly moving average. So and, and another thing is on a daily chart, look at the weekly chart. We broke out of a downtrend line. The market rallied, came back, tried to test the point of breakout, and now it's up. So let me get rid of all this daily stuff here. And you'll note that we are in a weekly buy mode. So last week's indecision and last week's topsy-turvy action on a weekly chart got us all the way back down to the monthly pivot support, and we popped back and closed. The open-close relationship still above the weekly moving averages. That's still 
fairly constructive and positive. So it's a, it's a good risk-reward ratio is looking at Cisco to the upside. I, I wish I had you know, a really dynamic uh, market to pick for you guys, but uh, for risk-reward perspective, Cisco was one to focus. Last week we talked about Dollar Tree, um, which worked out fairly well, and Dollar Tree, by the way, still looks uh, healthy. In addition, we wanted to take a look at RCI. Uh, what is RCI? Rogers Communications. This thing looks about as uh, ugly as possible next to uh, Netflix falling from the sky. But it's not, actually. And the funny thing is, when we take a look at a longer-term perspective of this chart, it's been in, I mean, how many of you we have seen when we get into a weekly low close doji and a weekly sell signal, and all of a sudden it pops right back up into your face, closes back above that high. This is almost a, uh, a, a trade that I kind of like in the fact that it went down and wouldn't go down, and as it enters a seasonally strong period of time in the communication sector, especially wireless telecom service sector, tends to uh, move up this time of year. I'm not sure if people that graduate get new phones. It just, you know, it just seems to be the wireless space is, is a possible trade. This, unlike Cisco, is a large cap stock, but uh, you know, larger capitalization because it's a $40 instrument. But uh, Rogers RCI, the reason I want to leave it for discussion is that it's already had a little bit of move, so I'd like to see a pullback. I'd like to see if the market can, you know, a tree sh shaker type event, um, you know, in, in some way maybe back, you know, 60 cent breakdown. I don't think you have to risk on this trade below 38.99. So if the entry on this is near remotely those highs, remotely near the moving average, so I can put it in here around 40.18. I mean, if we can kind of get that type of a pullback, the risk on that trade would be about just under 3%. What am I looking for out of this trade? I don't think we stop here. I think this market rallies a little bit more significantly as it enters a seasonally strong period of time. At the very least, if it takes time to get up into the moving averages, I think you know reasonable uh, expectations, and I'm not saying that we're going to go up to quarterly resistance, but the market generated a, uh, a kind of like a, a much significant lower low on the quarterly uh, charts, and we couldn't get down there, but we're entering a seasonally strong period of time. So this longer term downtrend that I drew in based off the weekly chart almost intersects near, and, and it makes sense, near the quarterly three, three quarter, that's that orange. So this is a quarterly pivot, but that orange, if you look at the orange, that three-month average of price, it would it seems that maybe it can take a pop over 42 and get to 42 and a half, and maybe a, maybe a little bit better out of it. So, with that said, when I take a look at this monthly chart, um, as you can tell, I just extended out the the longer term. It makes sense that if the market's in a, a sell mode and it won't go down, then if it pops in a seasonally strong period of time, or it pops within the rest of the sector. Uh, we could see that move, which would give you a, a short-term trade uh, based on this, this um, pattern and this sector. So when we take a look at the wire telecom service, you know, what names pop up here? Um, Crown Castle. And it's breaking out to the upside. So I want to take a look at what I try to talk about many times is, is it, is it just this one company or do other companies look like they're getting ready for a move higher and as I take a look at you know here's Sprint I mean it was a you know at one point a two dollar stock and now it's an eight dollar stock Sprint but someone likes buying Sprint because this long tail and that long tail it drops down and it pops right back up so looking at uh, uh, Sprint even on a weekly basis I would imagine at the telecom sectors if you break out, I mean, I can't imagine what would cause it to do it, but I'm just saying the fact that you had a weekly low close doji, a weekly PPS signal, it went down to monthly support, and if it enters a seasonally strong period of time, there was some buying coming in. If you look at this, one la just last week's move from 750 just straight up. So 
Uh, Sprint looks pretty good. It may be a little bit overplayed, but I can also point out, I don't know what it would take. This is, again, weekly charts, but a pop over that doji high of 960, more than likely you would see a test to about you know that, that high bet we had back in December. I don't know why or how, but a big long turn up sideways, it may try to pop. And this is not going to be something that's going to happen this week. This is probably July. So uh, watch uh, for moves, not just in one stock, but many names within that sector. So that's one of the things that I came up with you this week. And again, you know, it, it, I think it has a, a very good, strong risk reward ratio, uh, RCI. So there it is, RCI. And then next, last but not least, Intel. Um, you know, the chips, the semiconductors, the semiconductors are starting to perform. And when I look at this chart pattern, I mean, how many people don't like uh, trends, bear, bull flags, and then potential breakouts in the trend direction, right? So is this a more of a, it, it definitely looks like it could be potentially a bull flag. We had a high closed doji in the market, generated a, kind of a weird trade signal, PPS sell signal against a high closed doji, and it looks like the high closed doji might win. For Intel in the semi space, a close and a pop over 20, this 2674, I think that level will get you, that might be a little over exaggerated, but I think at least a, a 30, 40 cent pop in Intel, and that could happen uh, relatively quickly, if not back up to maybe testing that $29 high. And that, my friends, would freak people out. That's nothing, and I think there's just, you know, the fact that we are entering that seasonally weak period of time, but as you can see, it goes down going into May 23rd, and we have one more boost to the upside. And I don't think a lot of people are, are counting on chip demand, but um, I'll get to my relative strength in just a moment. Um, the next one is INAP. This is um, Internet software, another company that I found for our, our trading room, which could be, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small little swing trade, uh, intermediate term trade. It's in a range. It's at the bottom of the range, right? We came down, I mean, how many days in a row? You broke this, uh, you know, this, again, consistent pattern where you have a downtrend and then you generate. We didn't generate a PPS buy signal technically, but uh, this is considered a doji because of the open-close relationship is less than 8% of the overall range. Um, the volume didn't quite pop, so I'm looking for a very small risk. I would say look for a pullback over the next day or two if we can get, I'm not looking for a big move, but from 713 to 685, and your stops would have to go not under the absolute low. I think you can just put them underneath the monthly 641, and if we take a look at this, you'll note that um, it is a, about a 6% risk. So if you look at my sheets, any time um, you have a uh, big percentage risk, that's what this means. It's a big percentage risk. It's not a 2% or 3%. It's a 6% risk. And even if you wanted to say, well, forget John, and there's the opening range, and it just popped, darn it. Um, if it gets underneath um, the low and you want to put your stop underneath there, it's a 9% risk. So uh, Trading Triggers University, you know we, and, and mentoring students, take your, what your stop is based on your percent of overall trade, and it's not your uh, position size should be based on risk, okay? It's a big percentage risk, so you need to lower the position size. Uh, we have, uh, it's an intermediate term, mid-June type of move, and now it looks like it's just a today pop to the races, so sorry for that. Again, we'll go to the, We'll go to the drawing board. Um, weekly charts still in buy modes with most major indexes in a sideways range. ES formed a weekly doji. Oh, we got a potential for a mar major market move to the upside. Um, all the indices are, are in breakout mode right as I speak right now. We're already at 375 in the spoos, 16.612, a new high in the Dow, and they want to press this market. Um, I think what the key is to watch the NASDAQ. We're already at 35.74, okay? Now, um, I don't trust that year's uh, weekly close in the, in the TIFF because of the uh, factors I mentioned, but I still remain firm in the fact that we'll see a um, sector rotation 
And uh, if we take a look, deer, caterpillar, enter seasonally weak period, both rallied on light volume. We're looking for triggers. XLU, if the market's going to go up, who wants to be stuck in utilities? And they have uh, uh, completely shown that um, they're starting to show very similar topsy-turvy uh, selling action. Um, and then again, I've listed those names. The financials start to turn negative towards month end, especially this insurer. So I kept this on the board for Allstate and, and Chubb. CB stands for Chubb. W watch for uh, some, we got to look for some inherent uh, weakness there. And again, public storage. And I think that's a very good fundamental theme as we start to see people entering in homes, their stuff's coming out of storage. Anyway, telecoms tend to move up. Verizon, AT&T, RCI, hello, SBAC, uh, Sprint, USM, and even Vodafone. Anyway, that's um, going to get into our weekly signals. High closed OGs for the week. These are your names. Low closed OG, these are your names. And again, um, if you'll take a look at some of these names, you'll note that some of them are like uh, JP Morgan, investment banking, uh, RIG, which is in the oil space, and we've been uh, looking for a breakdown in oil as well as financials. So now what I want to just last but not least, and I know we're a little over time here and it's tough to carry on all of this, but I want to go over to, let me save this page real quick. I'll publish it one more time. And I'm going to go over here to my relative strength analysis. We're not chasing anything up here, uh, at least not yet from a day trade perspective. That's by any stretch of the imagination, friends. But um, take a look at this uh, relative strength chart. I thought this would be very interesting to uh, show you. Um, since the end of January. So why do I go from the end of January? Because the end of January, the first week of February, if we go and take a look at a chart of, let's say, the S&Ps real quick. Remember, on a daily chart, we had the January swoon. It started Oops, that's the April swoon. Here we go. I went to a daily chart. Here we go. All right, now I'm back again. All right, so January 23rd, the January profit-taking break, and then it kind of hit a lowest peak around the first week of February. So instead of saying, okay, John, let's see what the market did since the beginning of the year, why don't we see what the market did since the beginning of that January swoon? That was the profit-taking break that you know created opportunity, a daily high closed doji, and many sectors just surged, okay? So instead of looking at a year-to-date figure, let's take a look at, or a timing figure, like the end of the quarter, the end of the, the month, the, uh, the time. Let's take a look at these, these particular points of interest from a relative strength and find out what did they buy on that break. So we got two ways to look at the April 14th break, and we've got the February 5th break. Does that, hopefully that makes kind of sense sense to people. So if we look at the February um, fourth break more or less, so February 12th the market started to get its, its game on, we know without a doubt energy started to spike. And without a doubt we saw the utilities, which is the strawberry color, start to spike. And then this brown figure in here is the IXTC. Ah, and note that utilities start to go down and telecoms are starting to move up. This red is transportation pointing up. All of a sudden, this blue is material starting to go up. And then this purple for Easter is the SOX, the semiconductor index is starting to go up. So from a relative strength perspective, we're starting to see uh, a stronger move in some of these names. And so there, therefore, telecoms I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at Intel for uh, the uh, semiconductors. And then, lo and behold, we'll start to look at some of these other uh, relative strength uh, points of interest as the week continues. So the last break that we have, um, I think I thought it was kind of neat to say, okay, what's really recovering and what's performing and what's outperforming? And if I think that the utility sector is topping out, then it needs to start to underperform. And if we think that there's relative strength analysis and we're starting to see 
um, a tie, a sea of change, money coming out of one sector going into another, then that's where I say we've got to confirm that rel with relative strength. And that's where, in your sheet, I say, like, semantic is in that sector where it's rel RS is actually confirming it. So I just wanted to explain it to you. That's all I have for today's weekly planning and scanning. We have some definitive trades, some sectors to look at. And, you know, those were some very, what I thought, decent uh, low-risk reward objectives. And we still are looking for... Uh, a higher move coming in the NASDAQ as we start to see a recovery in some of these names. And the one that's going to do the most infliction on the bears is going to be coming from the biotechnology space. So if the funds are able to light the board one day with all sell mode and then the next day in all buy mode, um, as we have been seeing consistently, I would be really watching two or three names within biotech to see if they're up not only the same amount, forget that because they're different pricing, but look to see if they're up the same percentage amount and that will reflect the allocation that they're giving into that space. Anyway, I hope today's uh, event uh, finds uh, the information finds you well. The last thing I want to leave you with is our spread analysis still reflects higher prices coming and uh, as much as, as many doohickeys as we've had and scares, we're still on track for a move up. Our McClellan oscillator is not overbought by any stretch of the imagination on a daily basis. We are actually uh, getting into or got into maybe oversold territory. So we could see some upside, further upside gain uh, in, in the markets here. Thank you, everyone, for that. And we're going to stop the recording. And um, we'll start with our... Uh, Daily